Howdy, it's Tubal Cain again, and this multi-part video I guess could be called A Tale of Three Dividing Heads. So that's what I'm going to cover, and I've had plans for some time to cut gears, and uh, Keith Fenner beat me to it, and it's going to be pretty hard to beat anything that that man does, because he's a master. But I'm going to give it a try anyway. And I'm going to use uh, two of these dividing heads for that uh, project, and that's upcoming. But first, uh, let me give you a rundown on all three of these dividing heads and what their pros and cons are. And I do own these two. I borrowed this one. I'm working in a new part of my shop here that uh, normally isn't on camera. I'm just out of space, so I had to uh, light this area and, uh, and use it because I have so much other work going in in progress. But let's talk about this brown and sharp. I went down to my buddy Billy's uh, machine shop local here and I had him in class a hundred years ago and I, I really like him but his shop has pretty much gone CNC and I asked him I said Billy do you have a dividing head I can borrow and he said well yeah I think I do and so we uh, walked around the shop and in a dark corner in the bowels of his shop we found this brown and sharp dividing head and he said you're welcome borrow it as long as you want and I said well you got extra plates for it he said well you know I never have used this I've had it for years I don't know where it came from I never have used it I take it uh, and uh, there's some plates there I don't know what they are so I went down there with my grandson and we loaded it up and uh, luckily he had a man there that threw it in the trunk but this still was a pretty heavy uh, item for my 13 year old grandson and I to get out of the trunk and what I do is I run a rod a bar right through it and tight it, tighten it in the chuck and then we can lift that way but it's still pretty darn heavy to get down into the basement and certainly there's going to be a chore to get on and off the milling machine well I was all ready to clean it up so I could get it in order to use and then I thought well let me see if these plates work well there's four plates here but none of them belong to this As a matter of fact they're marked Bridgeport so these are not usable and then there were yet two more but they are not marked in any way and they certainly aren't the same size as this so there were no extra plates so already I was mildly discouraged but I thought, well, I'll clean it up and get ready to go here anyway. But then I found more and more things wrong with it. And I realized, in fact, and notice I had to put this on a, on a rug upside down here so I could move it, slide it around. It's so heavy. My mom taught me that. She said, turn a rug upside down. You can slide heavy things around. I think she read it on Heloise's column. A little sidetrack there. But uh, you will notice here that... This entire casting that would bolt on here and it would be U-shaped and bolt on over here is missing. So someone took this apart possibly 50 years ago, who knows, but a long time ago, and it's missing on this side as well. And it should go right around here. Furthermore, there are parts that are missing right here. And this is a dividing head that can be used for both uh, direct and uh, plain indexing. So I thought, well, this is still going to be neat to show, and it's got a three-jaw chuck on there. The other one does not have a three-jaw chuck, and I still might be able to use it. But the problem is, and I probably could make something here to cap, uh, cap that, but I don't want to spend that much time on it. And then I was looking at this other device here that is used for direct indexing, and that's damaged or broke. So this thing pretty much is a piece of junk. I don't want to mess with it. So... This is going to go back to Billy with a big thanks because he did not know that there was anything wrong with it. But he doesn't throw anything away as most machinists do not. So he'll, we'll put it back in a corner and be done with it. But that's all I'm going to say about this. But it is a 40 to 1 ratio. And a brown and sharp, of course, is a fine product. Anything they make is, is a fine, fine uh, quality. So off to the side that goes. And let me talk about the next dividing head. A man gave me this uh, little hardinge dividing head some years ago and it's a 4 to 1 ratio and that is the reason that I want uh, to use both this and the 40 to 1 ratio uh, uh, dividing head so I can show both. 
40 to 1 is the standard of the industry. 4 to 1 really is a bit of an orphan. It's easier to use, but because of that, it requires more plates. So there's four plates. And it's unusual that all four plates are still with it because they're, the man told me that the tailstock was long gone, but there was a tailstock for this. Don't know where it is. I'm sure it was probably thrown out. And there was a chuck on it. But since this came from a vocational school, as you can see, the chuck is damaged beyond redemption. Plus it does not run true. This is also a hermaphrodite hardinge thread, so that's a problem. And you'll notice here there's already damage to the thread. So I went ahead and made a thread protector. And there's no need to have that threaded because that just goes on with a brass screw that'll tighten down there and hold that in place. But the beauty of the uh, hardens is that it holds 5C collets. But again, the drawbar is long gone. So I made up a drawbar and I used the drawbar out of my spin index and adapted it, but yet it can be taken out of here and still used on the spin index. But this way I can hold my work with uh, collets. There, of course, was a center for this at one time, too. And that center is gone, and it would have held a dog but with a, a little bit of a holding device for the dog's tail. So you will see this later when I cut a gear and in other projects. And I have other uh, videos long, long ago that use this, so go back and, and look at them if you're interested in this little hardinge dividing head. And that's all I'm going to say about this for now as I get to the star of the show. And so the search was on. I checked eBay and there are a lot of them on eBay but they're all a million miles away and how are you going to ship something like this and of course they want premium uh, price for them. Some of them are a thousand dollars so on to Craigslist I went and lo and behold within moments I located one within 40 miles of my house. Have you noticed that everything that I say is about 40 miles? Well, it was up there fairly near Leland where I bought so many things from uh, my buddies at the screw machine shop. But this is a Cincinnati. And what a wonderful machine it is, or a attachment I should say. And let's go over some of its features. And it is heavy. 140 pounds and I had a heck of a time getting into, into the basement. And I did enlist my grandson, but that's all he could carry. And what is surprising is that Cincinnati made uh, this in three sizes. And this is the small one. And it's a 10 inch. So I'd hate to lift the big ones. But it's a magnificent uh, device. And it is in very, very good condition with just one little problem, which I'll get to here in a minute. I asked the man when we exchanged money, I said, do you got any extra plates for this? There's only one plate. He said, no, that's all there was with it that I know of. I don't know. So I thought, well, all right, I'll just have to cut gears that are within the capability of, of this uh, number plate on this side. But lo and behold, after doing a little uh, research on this, I found out that this plate is reversible. And in fact, on the back side, there is another set of holes. Can you see them? Now those are blind holes. They do not go all the way through. So do not confuse them with the holes that are on the front. Now there are also other plates available for this, but they would be used uh, for most obscure uh, numbers that you might be uh, needing to index or divide. And uh, this is going to service me just fine because the manual, and I downloaded a manual off the internet, shows that uh, you know there's about a thousand possibilities even with uh, with both sides here so this is going to be a good machine and it's a 40 to 1 ratio so 40 turns here will turn the spindle one turn but again there is no chuck and this is a two inch eight threads per inch so I need to come up with a backing plate so I can put a chuck on that and I looked it up and this is a brown and sharp taper. I believe a number 10. It's in the manual. 
I thought, well, no problem. There's got to be tens of thousands of brown and sharp tapers with a center on it and whatnot because, you know, there just has to be. I looked on the internet and the cheapest one I could find was like $180 for a center. I was shocked. You know, I didn't want to pay that much for the whole darn thing. Here's the manual I downloaded. It was a PDF file and it covers this exact model. Notice that they made a tailstock too and that's so massive I bet that it weighed uh, 50 pounds and this is a little steady rest here. And yes I just looked it up and that is a number 10 brown and sharp taper. But looking through this without belaboring the point here you will see that one more page I think these are all of the divisions that are available just with the one reversible plate. So there's quite a, a possibility here. This head is capable of doing helical milling. And that's what this shaft is all about. This is just a protector to protect the spline. But this can be driven off of a milling machine, but it has to be the correct machine, typically probably a, a Cincinnati. And this would be turned by a train of gears and turn the uh, spindle as the milling progressed. And that would give a helix. Let's take a look at that in the book. In this photo out of the Cincinnati book, again, here's the dividing head mounted on a Cincinnati mill. And the work being performed is a helix is being cut on this workpiece here. And again, this shows the gear train which is driven off of the main lead screw on the x-axis and uh, is attached here to the dividing head and rotates the spindle on the dividing head at a very slow speed as the table is fed in the x-direction rotating the work allowing a helix to be cut. In this view of a Cincinnati milling machine with the dividing head mounted, you can see the gear train here on the end of the table. And these gears are rotated by the lead screw in the x-axis. And uh, the ratios can be changed here and that is what in turn will rotate the dividing head very slowly to allow you to cut helixes. I, of course, will never be cutting a helix, but here's a reamer that has a helix, just so that you see what I'm talking about. And if this was a project, and it was soft steel, and it was mounted in the spindle here, and we were going to mill these grooves here, you can see that the uh, dividing head has to turn a little bit as the table on the milling machine is fed uh, against uh, the revolving cutter that is uh, that a cutting these grooves. Now in order to do that, of course, we will have to loosen this again and disengage this little uh, toothed part, whatever that is called, so that this can spin freely. Now, this would be hooked up, of course, to the gear train on a Cincinnati mill, and as the table traveled in the X direction, this would be turned ever so slowly. Let me show you the gears. I put the helical reamer in this end. This isn't really the end that holds the work, but just so that you can see it. As uh, the gear train would turn this, you're going to see that this is rotating and the worm is now engaged, but can you see that it's rotating very slowly? Of course as this is turned. And taking this cover off, which had three screws, we can look in there and see the gear train. There's a set of bevel gears in there and then the spur gear here. You rotate those so you can see what's happening. And there's uh, oil holes here and little oilers in this plate and on that many other places on the uh, dividing head there was a great attention to detail when designing and building this thing. I've mentioned this wonderful book uh, many times 
My dad had a copy of it, but as I recall, it was blue. And this is one I only acquired recently. It was in a, a box at an auction. And uh, it's a treatise on uh, milling and milling machines by the Cincinnati Company. And it's about, oh, five or six hundred pages. Make that uh, nine hundred pages. Everything you ever wanted to know about milling is in there and probably a lot more than what you wanted to know. But there is approximately 100 pages in here that cover the dividing head, this exact dividing head, how to use it, how to make cams, gears, cutters, just about anything that you can think of is in this book. It is an exhaustive study, not for the light-hearted.